So I've been trying to wrap my head around multiple discriminant analysis. It's fairly convoluted uh, for someone who's never done it before, fairly intimidating and daunting. So I've spent some time reading the Hare book, um, Hare et al. 2010, Multivariate Data Analysis, and trying to understand what I see in SPSS. And so what I'm going to do is just sort of talk my way through what I've learned and uh, essentially log it so that I can remember it. And I think it might be helpful for others who are trying to learn multiple discriminant analysis as well. So first off, when is it appropriate? It's appropriate when your DV is categorical, but your IVs are metric. Now this is the exact opposite of a MANOVA, which has metric DVs, but categorical IVs. So what's it good for? It's good for predicting group membership. For example, is someone who's coming to get a loan a low-risk customer or a high-risk customer? Uh, we can predict using certain variables uh, whether they're in a low-risk group or a high-risk group. Now, you might have other research questions like how well do satisfaction and loyalty predict repeat buyer behavior? So you could have different kinds of buyers those who are repeat buyers and those who are one-time buyers. And these different kinds of buyers, our customers, have different characteristics. How can we use those characteristics ahead of time to predict whether this person will be a uh, repeat or a one-time buyer? The question I'm going to do is far less practical, um, but I think relatable to a lot of people, and it's regarding burgers. If we take sodium, fat, and calories of the burgers, are we able to then predict which restaurant the burger comes from? So that's what I'm going to try to do. Let's jump into multiple discriminant analysis. Here we are burgers, data, analyze. We're going to go to classify, discriminant. And in here, uh, let me just reset all of this. Okay, I'm going to have a grouping variable and I call it restaurant number. Now, okay, so your, your grouping variable, that's sort of like your dependent variable. We're trying to predict which group someone will be in or something will be in. In this case, it's burgers. And, and the grouping variable would be the restaurant. Now, originally in my data set, I had restaurant. Let me come back to this here. Let's see, I had, where'd it go? Restaurant. And if I double click this, you can see in the data view, the restaurant is just the name of the restaurant. The multiple discriminant analysis won't allow you to enter string variables in this categorical dependent variable grouping variable box. Uh, you'll notice restaurant is not even an option here. Uh, it doesn't show up where it's supposed to. So what I had to do um, was automatically recode all of these into numbers. So now, so now Arby's is one, Burger King is two, etc. And I created a number for that. Here it is, grouping number. And what range do I want to use? Well, I want to predict uh, whether they're in, um, in restaurants one through seven, all seven restaurants. Although that will get kind of messy. Let me do one through three. That might be easier. Okay, continue. Statistics. Oop, not yet. Let's throw in some variables. I'm going to throw in just my standardized variables here of calories, fat, sodium, fiber, sugar, and protein. Now, if you have a lot of variables like this, you want to use a stepwise method. What this will do is look at each variable one at a time and determine which one is going to be the best for um, separating or predicting, I guess, group membership. And then it'll look through the next and the next and the next. And so it'll determine the best set of variables to predict group membership. The other method is a simultaneous or enter independence together. This just takes all of them together and says, how well do these all together predict group membership? And it does not exclude any, as far as I remember. So I have a lot. I'm going to use stepwise method. In statistics, I would like to see the means, the ANOVAs, the box M. Um, I can't remember if I use the Fisher's coefficient, but I'm going to check it anyway. And um, hit continue method, I'm going to use the Mahalanobis Mah Mah distance. Uh, this is the one to use when you're using a stepwise method. Um, 
At least that's what Joe Hare says in his book. And continue classify. I would like to do uh, classification uh, from prior probabilities, compute from group sizes. What this does is it says, uh, what is the likelihood of randomly being selected for the correct group? Um, and it's going to be based on your group size rather than all groups being equal. Because I know I have like 20 burgers from McDonald's, but only, I don't know, 10 burgers from Arby's or something like that. So I'm going to do it based on group sizes. If your groups are fairly different, I recommend this option. If your groups are all equal, then it doesn't really matter. Uh, if all else fails, just do uh, just compute from group sizes because that won't be accurate uh, regardless. All right, um, covariance within groups. I want to see a combined groups plot. And do, 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 do. that looks good. Save. There's nothing I really want to save, although uh, it might be interesting to save this one. In fact, I'll save this just to show you something. I haven't actually played with that yet, but I think I know what it means. It should save a new variable um, that has the probability of being in the group. Um, in fact, I should say both predicted group membership. So it'll say for burger one, the Arby's Q sandwich, um, what is the probability of being in whatever group uh, it's predicted to be in? So I'll have two new columns here, predicted group membership, sort of like uh, in our other videos where we show cluster membership number and then the likelihood of being in that group based on the variables we selected, uh, these variables right here. All right, now I'm going to hit OK and show you the results and sort of talk through them, some of them. I still don't know what all of them mean, I don't think. All right, this is just uh, descriptive statistics, shows the mean, standard deviation, all that stuff. Um, test of equality of group means. This is meaningful. Um, this is like an ANOVA. It says for all these restaurants, uh, numbers one through three is what we used, are there significant differences between calories uh, among those restaurants? And then for total fat, etc. So it's sort of like an ANOVA. And the answer is, well, not terribly different on calories, pretty different on fat, not different on sodium. In fact, none of these are significantly different at 0.05 level except total fat and protein. So we'll see what happens when we start um, choosing variables as predictors. Let's come down. We have the box test. And if you look at the boxes M, this test result here, you want the sig value to be not significant. What this means is that uh, you have met criteria for multivariate normality. Um, so you're not violating any normality assumptions. If this is significant, uh, less than 0 0.01 is the recommended uh, relaxed threshold. Um, if it's less than 0 0.01, then you have issues with multivariate normality, um, the covariance matrices uh, between the groups, or restaurants in this case, are not roughly equivalent, and so there's a problem. Um, what can you do about it? Well, you could do transformations and things like that that I'm not going to show in this video. Stepwise statistics, um, let's see, it retained fat, protein, and calories, is that right? Here is fat, protein, and calories. So you can see, I'm actually just, just going to jump down here um, to this next one. Uh, so it says these are the variables that were included in the analysis. Um, here's their d squared, the Mahalanobis d squared, and it is in the right range. Um, and so this is the minimum d squared between the closest groups. What does it mean? Uh, it just means that these were the best predictors, fat, protein, and calories. Now we jump down. These are the ones maybe that they didn't use, sodium, fiber, and sugar, uh, the ones they didn't use. And it's probably because the minimum d squared was so large. I'm trying to minimize the, the d squared, I think. Let's see, the Wilkes Lambda, I'm actually going to skip that one. Um, jumping down, jumping down. The structure matrix, we're looking for values greater than 0.4 on an absolute scale. So we have 0.4 for protein. And then in function 2, we have 0.7 for sugars, 0.683 for calories. 
So uh, we have good strong loadings there. We have 0.4, somewhat lower but close to 0.4 on these others. Um, so again, it removed fat, sodium, and fiber because uh, they did not load as strongly is my guess. Although 0.48 and 0.43, hard to tell. Okay. And we move down to prior probabilities. I should, I have examples of these in the slides I'll show in a minute, but essentially this is, uh, this says if we were to throw out these burgers into restaurants randomly, what is the probability that they would actually land in restaurant one, two, or three? And in this case, we have a 41, roughly 41% 41 chance of landing in restaurant one and a 45% uh, chance and a 14% chance of landing in two and three. Um, so that's if we threw it at random. Now we have this canonical discriminant functions graph, which will help us see visually how different everything is. Let me double click it. because there, there are ways to really improve this. First off, I'm going to get rid of ungrouped cases. Uh, these are cases from uh, restaurants four through seven. So I'm going to change the color to nothing. So now these are invisible. I'm going to change Chick-fil-A because it's almost impossible to see. Change it to red. I'm actually going to fill it in with red. Burger King is green and fill it in with green. And Arby's is blue. Fill it in with blue. Okay. And another really cool thing you can do is um, if you have, let me show here's the properties window. If you right click and say properties window, then this guy will open. And you can change the way all this looks. This isn't really important, but I like to fiddle with it. Um, you can make it a star or something, make it gold, why not? Fill gold, that's hard to see. Let's make it orange and orange and hit apply. And now we can see that these are the group centroids, so the center of the plotted functions. Let me close that. And one other really cool thing I learned is you can resize with this button right here, you can resize the plotting area. Oops, escape. Ah, I messed that up. Cancel. And try again. Try again. Here we go. Resize to here. Hit OK. There we go. That spreads it out, fills the graph a little bit better. And now if you close this, it'll be uh, all fixed. Let me right click copy special. If you're going to copy into a Word document or a PowerPoint, I recommend the meta file, WMF EMF, Microsoft's default picture format. And let me go into a, uh, you know, let me just pull it into a new PowerPoint. PowerPoint. Control A, delete, Control V, here it is. Let me increase the size a little bit. And what we're doing is we're looking to see how different uh, each group is, each restaurant is, in terms of those variables we used to predict. So calories, fat, and protein. So if I go back here, I can see that uh, the center of Arby's is way over here, Chick-fil-A is way over here, Burger King is way over here. They're fairly different. Um, if I want to get real fancy, I can use this little drawing tool and try to um, outline them. Okay. So we can see that uh, these are different. There is some overlap, but there is a lot of uh, different place for Burger King and Arby's particularly. Chick-fil-A has fewer sandwiches, so it's harder to determine. Um, but you can see it would be easy to predict if you're an Arby's, pretty easy to predict if you're, burger, if you're a Burger King burger, a little bit harder to predict if you're Chick-fil-A. And we'll see how that pans out in just a sec. If I go back here and get that prior probabilities table, copy that out, and oh, it's not going to copy just right. So copy special as a metlif, and go back here. You push this over. Whoops, Control Z, Control A, push that over, and stick this in here. Those are the prior probabilities. Let me go grab 
the actual classification. Did it not classify for us? Uh oh. Okay, I figured out why it didn't classify for us. Um, if you go back to the discriminant analysis and in the classify area, uh, make sure to check the classification results. Uh, we need those. I have case wise and summary table. Continue, continue. And if you go to the bottom, uh, here we are. I believe this is just the summary table, actually. So these are uh, the actual predicted group memberships. So if I copy special this, and again, Metlif, OK, and PowerPoint, paste. OK, so what we see here, get some more space. What we see here is the prior, again, this is if at random we threw burgers at restaurants, uh, this is the likelihood they'd be in restaurant one, two, or three. In this case, it's Arby's, Burger King, or Chick-fil-A. Um, and here is using the predictive function, using those three variables we used to make these predictions. Excuse me, let's go up here. Calories, total fat, and protein. How accurate would we, we be in prediction? Now, if you look down here in the second half of the predicted group membership table, you can see for Arby's, the blue here, we would be right almost 83% of the time. For Burger King, we'd be right almost 87.5% of the time. And for Chick-fil-A, we'd be right about half the time, 50% of the time. Now, the question is, is that good enough? Is that substantially different from random? And the answer is, uh, according to the literature, you want to be about 25% better than random. So if I get my calculator, here's a calculator, and say 0 0.408, 0 0.408 times 1.25, so 125%, 25% better, 1.25, I get 51%. So the predictability, the predicted group membership number for Arby's, Blue, first restaurant, needs to be better than 51% to say that these are good predictors for determining restaurant membership. And indeed, I am far above that. And, and it's the same case for this one. And uh, the 50%, even though this is only right half the time, it's still far better than random. You can see, let me go here and delete, see, 0 0.141 times 1.25 equals only 17.5%. If I could predict it 17.5%, I'd be better than random. So I'm doing way better than random, uh, even for Chick-fil-A. All right, let's see if I missed anything. I have some notes here. So other things to consider. Uh, we talked about boxes M. We talked about step versus simultaneous. Talked about loadings. Talked about Wilkes Lambda and tolerance. I didn't talk about tolerance. Let me see if I have a tolerance output here. Um, it would be up. Tolerance. Here it is. Variables not in the analysis, variables in the analysis. All right, you want the tolerance value to be greater than 0.1, um, ideally. That What this means is the variables are not multicollinear, uh, meaning predicting the same thing uh, in the dependent variable. So overlapping in their explanation of variance. At least that's how it works in regression. In this case, it would be overlapping in their ability to predict which, mem which group you're in. So we see with uh, total fat and protein, 0 0.1, 0 0.375, these are great. Uh, calories, not such a great one. It's a little collinear, multicollinear with um, these other two, but it's still being used. So that's the tolerance. Uh, it means multicollinearity. And I think that's everything. So that's what I've learned on multiple discriminant analysis. I hope that was not too rambling. Uh, and I hope it was useful and at least acts as a primer for you as you begin to think about using multiple discriminant analysis.